Welcome to Geocache Adventures with me, Shadow Dragon One, where I discuss geocaching and my adventures with it. If you enjoy the show, please leave a review wherever you listen to podcasts or on the Geocache Adventures Facebook page. You can also sign up for the Geocache Adventures newsletter, which features upcoming episode information, behind the scenes articles, and other fun articles and information. This interview was recorded using Zoom and may sound different than other podcast audio. Hello everybody, Amy Shadow Dragon One here, and with me is Joe, Ray, and John, fellow geocachers and creators of the HandyCache GeoArt. Thank you all for joining me today. Thanks for having us. Hello. So can you all share your geocaching names with us? Uh, I'll, I'll go first. My name, is, my geocaching name is Joe's Dolphins. I'm a big Miami Dolphins fan, and I said, oh, I'll just put Joe in front of Dolphins, Joe's Dolphins. My geocaching name is Marble Guy. Uh, I've been caching since 2004. I just, I keep enjoying it, so I keep doing it. He does it a lot. I do it a lot. <laughs> John is the state's number two guy, is it still? Number two in fines? Number three in fines, in, in, number two in fines in Connecticut, number three in New England. Wow. Yeah. And I was ahead of him at one time until he decided to retire. <laughs> my name is Raymond, or Ray, and my geocache name is M-M and I. It uh, stands for me, myself, and I. <laughs> nice. So how do you three know each other? Uh, we all, all met through geocaching, probably at an event many years ago, and just became friends through geocaching. Nice. We've also cached together um, in different, at different times. Sometimes all three of us might go out together, but um, we do cache together. It's not that we, you know, don't like, don't like each other. We actually like each other. <laughs> and, uh, Sometimes. Part of it, part of it uh, got, got together um, prior to the Handy Cache uh, geo art. Um, we were involved in putting together the Connecticut Star. Um, so the, between the three of us um, and an ex-reviewer um, that, that had to stop reviewing, um, the four of us put together the Connecticut Star. Um, and still to this day, we maintain that, that uh, geo art also. Okay, so this is not your first series of geo art together. Correct. Yeah, the first one was our okay. Connecticut Star. We were at, I think we were all sitting at an event and I said, why don't, uh, Connecticut didn't have a star yet. It's become very popular that every state had a star geo art. And um, I said, why don't we do that? And we all got together and we all hid the caches together. We all had a good piece of work to do. That was a very challenging piece of geo art to put out because that was our first thing and it was very challenging. Okay, so just, as a side note, in case any listeners aren't familiar with GeoArt, this is a series of geocaches, which is typically a mystery or unknown, however you want to call it, geocache, and they form a picture. And your handy geocache, GeoArt, actually forms the picture of the traditional handicap sign yeah. that we're used to seeing. So can you tell us why a handicap sign? What inspired that? If you guys don't mind me going first, um, our reviewer at the time was, his name was Miles, geocaching name Milestone. And Milestone was our reviewer. He loved to geocache. He loved the outdoors. He loved to hike. His caches were always hard and you had to walk a long ways. And he had a stroke. And after the stroke, he was forced to be in a wheelchair. Hmm. And so no more hiking for him. And I think we all got together and wanted to do something nice for him. So he would be able to find geocaches still that were easily accessible for him. So we decided to, in his honor, basically, to do the handy, handy caches. And how many caches make up this geo art? Ray, John, you would have to go chime in on that one we have 30 in that art 
And each one of them is handicap accessible, correct? Correct. So how did you go about verifying that each one was truly handicap accessible? Just by, just by eyeing it, getting out of the car and you know, making sure the train was a one or very, very, very close that a wheelchair would be able to maneuver to the geocache. So how did you go about planning out the heights for this? You, you guys mentioned that you had one geo art, the Connecticut start prior to this. Were you able to take lessons learned from doing that geo art series and apply it to this one? Well, we kind of give the credit to that to Mr. DeSellis, seems how he's the computer guru of the group. Um, and he can take a, a point on a map and just boom, all of a sudden it's like 30 seconds later, he has where all these caches need to be in proximity um, to each other. And then we just have to go out and find the right locations to hide them and then put the pages together. But most of that credit goes to Ray. So for mystery or unknown, however everybody likes to call them something a little different, typically there's a puzzle involved that you have to solve to get the correct coordinates. Did you guys make 30 different puzzles or did you make one puzzle all the same and make 30 different versions of it or what did you do for that? Well, we made that each page is literally handicap accessible. So the puzzles, all you had to do was scroll down to where the additional waypoints is and the final location was given plainly there. Okay. Okay. And then we, we hid the geocaches under the name Timmy and Jimmy from South Park characters. And um, we wanted to make sure that the handicap community was accepting of we didn't want to make fun of handicapped people using timmy and jimmy from south park as the geocaching name that hid these caches so we did some research and found we found out that the handicapped community loves timmy and jimmy from south park that's really neat so it sounds like you guys went to a lot of great lengths to just really make sure this was something that everybody could embrace yes that's really great how long did it take you to create all of these i think me ray and john went out in one night probably started at 7 p.m and we were done by we hit them at night i think seven seven to probably 11 o'clock at night to hide them Oh, wow. Ray already knew approximately we had a some of our caches we had to archive or to get to make room for the series. But we knew in general where we wanted to hide them. And we knew there was basically room for all the caches. So now our hometown area is swamped with geo art caches. <laughs> one of the one of the areas that we have is we have a very large mall area um, and a lot of mall sprawl. Um, so there's quite a few strip malls and stuff, and it's, it's pretty easy to get into these um, strip malls and, and mall parking lots um, to use um, lamp posts or fences or whatever that's close. Um, so there's a lot of business um, in the immediate area. Um, so it made it a lot easier to, to be able to place them. Did you have any trouble getting permission when you placed any of them, or was everybody pretty much accepting? And, and all four, the geocaches? I would say all in all, pretty acceptable, pretty accepted. There was only a few that um, didn't know what geocaching was. And we had to, you know, show them paperwork and what geocaching was and what we were doing. As it's definitely easier when they, they know what you're talking about when you're yes. geocaching. Some of them exactly. have no the area has had caches for a very long time, so it's, it's, it's known. Okay. We just added a bunch. Your cache types, it sounds like a lot of these would be what people like to classify as uh, parking grabs. Is that correct? This series, yes. 
Yeah, we also have another Timmy and Jimmy handicap accessible. They're not called handy caches, but those are on a bike trail and all of them are waist, waist high or lower that a, a handicapped person would be able to access. Is that series, is that like a power trail series you set up or how is that one done? The second one is all done on a bike trail. And I think that one has, I know it has over 30 caches. I think, I don't know exactly how many. Yeah. That is a paved, that is a paved trail. So it's very easy for anyone to uh, wheelchair or scooter or mobility scooter their way along. Except that it does have some hills on. Yes. Okay. It's part of the East Coast Greenway. If you haven't heard of, heard of oh. the East Coast Greenway, it runs from Florida to Maine. Okay. Um, it's also part of that trail. There are quite a few greenways across the country, and that one just happens to be our local. Okay. So when you guys submitted your, your geo art, do you submit all 30 at once and have them all released at once, or how did that happen? Ray, you, go, you chime in on this. You're the one who submitted okay. it. What I did is I gave the reviewer a heads up so they would know that they were coming down the pike and wouldn't be surprised. Uh, then uh, simply just gave them good warning, uh, made sure that everything, all the T's were crossed and I's were dotted. And uh, she locked them. And we just waited for them to come out. We gave them an approximate when we'd like them to come out. And they all came out. Nice. Did you have any that you ran into issues getting published? Like the, the reviewer came back with comments that you had to address or was it all pretty straightforward for you all? It was pretty straightforward. They seemed yeah. very accepting of, of it. Um, That's nice. I think we checked and double checked and triple checked each coordinate, make sure it was far enough away and just the right amount of, the question mark has to, I, believe the question mark has to be within two miles of the actual geocache or one mile. We made sure all of the coordinates were correct and everything met the guidelines. So I don't think we ran into any issues at all. Oh, that's nice. The easiest it was thing smooth. on that though is, is to, you gotta make sure that you, you get your reviewer involved. Tell them what's going on so they don't get surprised. Yeah. A lot of them will up. want the information up front. Send it, send me what you have so I can review it. Um, before you send them, submit them for publication. Oh. Um, we did the same thing on the uh, on the Connecticut Star. We sent everything to the reviewer, all the coordinates, all the puzzles, um, and, and he had like a month to be able to review everything so that when we wanted it to come live, um, all we had to do was just let him know what date and time we wanted it to come live. Oh, okay. Nice. So when you laid out the points for the image, did you just go on to like Google Maps and, and put a bunch of pins in the shape that you wanted or how did you lay those out? No, that'd be me again. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, I, picked, I picked a good spot when we, when we knew where we wanted them to be. Uh, I just where picked a central where? location, uh, very simply picked a central location and I wrote uh, sort of a program that can change the size of the art to whatever I wish it to be. And I just resized it until all the points were within two miles of every other point. And sometimes you have to slide it around a little bit, the central point, just to get it right. And it, it takes time. It doesn't, it's not quite as quick as John said, but it, it's pretty quick. And uh, once I had them all, I, I had all my coordinates and I was ready to go. Just start, cut, paste, copy, cut, paste, copy, paste, copy, paste, <laughs> you know, 30 times. It's pretty simple. That's great. It's, Some... it's like chess. The rules are simple, <laughs> but the, the, uh, the uh, doing it is tricky. Yeah. Sometimes it seems like it's going to be a real, you, you try to publish a cash hide and you think, okay, I've got all this down and it's going to be straightforward. And a month later, you finally get it all ironed out after several go arounds and then you finally get it published. So, <sighs> It, it's kind of amazing that you got 30 caches published so smoothly all at once. 
Yep, we, that star really taught us a lot. That star yeah. taught us a lot. Those were 51 caches. So 50 caches for the star and then one for the, for the bonus. And that, that helped us a lot. We worked on that really hard. So everything else is pretty much smooth sailing. And Will, a milestone, um, the one who had the stroke, he, I believe this was created before his stroke. So he was a, I forgot which part role he had in the star. He created all the cash pages. Yes, he did. He created all the cash pages for the Connecticut right. star. And Joe, Joe created all and the And then puzzles. we added the details. Yeah. Joe created all the puzzles. Um, I had about 65 caches in the state park um, that we archived in order to put the star in. Wow. Well, we archived 51 of them, so I had room. And it took us, uh, I think, three hours to place all the caches when we went out. We went out in three different directions. We had all the coordinates where we were going to put them. Pick up the old cache, put up, put down the new one. And yeah, so the next day. Yeah, John series was after historic people. Like, okay, Joe, pick up John Madison and put Connecticut Star <laughs> One down. So I was like one through, I was like one through seventeen or one through twenty, and Ray hit twenty-one through whatever, and. John hid the other ones. So it was just like, pick up John Madison cash, put down Connecticut Star. Well, they were, they were historic because they were in Nathan Hale State Forest. So we have, the, we have the Nathan Hale Homestead. Oh, okay. And, and behind the Nathan Hale Homestead is a state forest, which is rather large. And so that's where the star is. That's all hiking. Okay. It was a labor, I don't know, I wouldn't, a labor of love to put out the star because we were very happy to do it. So it wasn't really a labor. And then when we were putting together the Handicash series for Will, that was a labor of love. Uh, he wasn't just a reviewer, he was a very good friend. So how, your friend Will, did you guys meet him through geocaching or did you know him outside of geocaching? I met him through geocaching. I went. Uh, I met him at my first event. I probably had ten caches under my belt when I met him. Okay. I, I met my wife through geocaching at an event. I met my wife at a geocaching event, and she already knew Will, but I didn't know Will at the time. So uh, the first time I met Will was at a geocaching event. And I met all these guys at geocaching events, including Joe's wife and uh, Will's wife. She's also a geocacher. Great people. It's amazing the bonds you can make just by geocaching and going to events like that. Oh, absolutely. So I have to ask, did Will find all in the series? Did he complete the geo art? I don't think he completed it yet. I think he found, a, found some. He has to be taken yeah, he has to be them, taken, so. and it's a lot of a lot of work for his wife to get him in the in the big SUV, and, and she still she still works a full time job, and you know so. Well, that's that's great that he has her to to help him, and that he can still get out and do it. And how amazing of you guys to put this together for him! That really is something special. It's really incredible that you guys did that. Well, thank you. Do you have any advice? For anybody who wants to create a geo art, oh, Learn, read about it. Ask questions from other people first. I don't recommend it for someone who is a newbie to geocaching. Um, people that, to me, people that just started out geocaching, they only use their phones and they don't utilize. The website at all. I think that if you're just a phone cashier and only a phone cashier, you're going to run into a lot of problems creating GeoArt. I think a GPS is more handy yeah. than a computer. Sure. I'd say make sure you have the space to do it because it takes up a lot of space. I mean, you know, it's going to take you five or six square miles to put it out, anything of any size. Yeah, and um, there's going to be a lot of other probably puzzle cast area. You have to make sure you have solved those and figure out that you're far enough away from that final location before you place a cache. 
because the worst thing you want to do is hide 50 caches or 30 caches and find out 10 of them are too close to another cache that you didn't know, mm. didn't know about. Do you have any advice for anybody that wants to place a handicap accessible geocache? Yeah, contact MM and I. <laughs> <laughs> he can he can help you. <laughs> right, right. But yes. <laughs> They're very sure simple. They're anything to... anything that I know Ray's breaking up, but He's also, we also have another uh, art work that's in the area um, that another friend of ours has put together of a, of a cat. And uh, Ray was kind of instrumental in putting that art together also. Oh, the Minu, a lot, a lot of work Minu Kitty Geo art. Yeah, Minu Kitty. Um, Ray helped her a lot with, with locations for that and uh, where the puzzles needed to be. Um, so Ray's being a little, uh, you know, humble. Yeah, Amy, if you're, able, if, if you're able to look, booted, at, but I'm uh, back. look look in the Newington, Connecticut area and zoom out on your map, you'll see this perfectly formed cat, the Minu Kitty GeoArt. I will look that up. And Ray, I'm sorry, we lost you when you were giving your your tips for hiding the handicap accessible geo caches. Would you mind repeating that for us? Sure. If you're just gonna hide one or two or ten. Uh, the best thing to do is just to set up a lawn chair and sit and say, could I reach this? Wow. That's a good tip. I don't think I would have thought to, to do that, but it makes sense. Yeah. The other option is sometimes there are people on crutches who can reach higher. Um, just got to let people know. Uh, otherwise, it's, it's just very straightforward. The hardest part is muggles. That's all. <laughs> that is that is the hardest part ever in geocaching. Yeah. I think <laughs> once every three months, Ray gives me a text and goes, "Joe, we gotta go replace some containers and logbooks." <laughs> so he picks me up and we go for a ride and check on all the logbooks, replace some caches that might be missing. It's great that you guys are maintaining it so well. There, it's so disappointing when you get a cache or a cache series and the, the CO is just not active anymore and it's just a wet, soggy mess or missing. It's, it's great to see geocachers actively maintaining geocaches. Yeah, it's nice to see a dry logbook when you open up a cache. Yes, it is. <laughs> There was one recently where construction had sprung up right where the cache was. So we had to relocate it just outside the fence line. So we did. And then uh, there's another one uh, where uh, we had the construction also took that one away. So we waited. And when they rebuilt it, we replaced it. It was a nano on a signpost. That's very, very simple. And what was funny though is that later they painted by hand the, the post. And they painted the cache. Oh my! It, it was a black nano. Now it's a yellow nano, painted the same <laughs> color as the signpost. Hey, it still blends in. <laughs> yeah. It blends in perfectly and perfectly -er now. Yeah. So they must have spray painted it, not hand painted it. But it was pretty funny. We laughed pretty hard when we saw it. Did the paint <laughs> bind up the container and make it difficult to open at all? No, nope. no, nope. they just they painted just the lid. Oh, it was miraculous. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> yeah, we got a good laugh when we saw that. Is there anything else about this series or geocaching in general or anything that you guys would like to share with us? Have fun. Yeah, have fun. Enjoy. Um, I'm on a rant right now against phone cachers, but other than that. <laughs> the one nice thing about phone caching is that I have found when you have kids and they're kind of in that 
early elementary, you know, second, like my son's in second grade yeah. and he always wants to be on a screen. It's like, you don't need to be on a screen all the time. You know, let's, it got really bad with the whole COVID situation and having to be homeschool and all that has just made the whole want to be on a screen even more than it used to be. So the nice thing about the phone cache is here, I'll let's go to the park. I'll give you the phone. You can <laughs> yeah. direct us to the geocache. Yeah. And he thinks that's awesome because one, he's got the phone, but two, he gets to be in charge and tell us where we're going. So when you're seven, that's a pretty big deal to get to tell mom and dad, we're going this way. So that there is that aspect of the, the phone caching that can. Oh yeah. It, has, it definitely has its pluses. I don't yeah. get me wrong. I do use it. Like if I just run out of the house to grab a first to find or a quick cache, I'll use the phone rather than load my GPS. But if I'm, if I'm going geocaching, I know I'm going from morning to the night with these guys or someone else. I make sure I bring load my GPS. What kind of handheld do you use? Uh, right now it's a Garmin Oregon 700 and Ray put maps on it. So it's Ray, it's now a what? An Oregon 700, 750. Because the Oregon 700 just has base maps on it. And Ray was able to put topo maps on it. Oh, nice. I have a 66 ST Garmin. And then when, I, when I'm traveling in the car on road trips, I, they don't make it anymore. It was, a, it was for the car. It was called the Garmin New V500. And you're able to put, it accepts um, GPX files. So you're able to put GPX files in it. So your car GPS has the hints, descriptions, everything so when you're driving by oh there's a cache over you're on a road trip at a rest stop oh there's a geocache at this rest stop let's pull over and i know john uses his normal nuvi and he's able with gsec he's able to put the geocaches on his nuvi so when he's driving he knows where to go and he'll have all the hints and descriptions on his car gps yeah, also. I, could, I could probably put fifty thousand on my gps if i wanted to oh wow car. Well, they're, they're going as the GGG, GZZ file, so they don't take up any space. But it also oh. has hints and the description. It's got all the information on it. Okay. Yeah, so when we're driving down the road, uh, we know well, there's a cache there that we haven't found. <laughs> but usually we have a plan ahead of time when we go geocaching. We, we know where we're going. But let's say me and my wife, my wife is from Montreal. So when we go to Montreal, I load the GPS's. Uh, route to where we're going and the area. So when, no matter where we're driving, if there's a geocache on either side of the road, it'll show it. Nice. Very nice. Okay. And it makes our five and a half hour drive into an eight hour drive. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that. that's yeah well you got to take a break from the car sometimes so <laughs> yeah oh time to stretch my legs <laughs> she goes no you know there's a geocache here isn't there yep no, no. <laughs> that's funny i mean on the, on the recent 11 hours there was one trip i had home from a vet sure i had to stop i had to make i had to make stops on that 11 hour drive from midwest geobash how many did you yeah. find on that trip you got a couple of new states uh one new state michigan Michigan. Uh, How many more states, John, do you have to go before you get all of them? Five. Five more states. That's impressive. <laughs> yeah, I was, I was the first one to, um, I went to Nevada to do the ET highway. I was the first one in our group to do that. So when I came back from there, I, I was ahead of everyone. Because in three days, I found... I forgot the exact number. Let's say it was 1,500, 19, 1900 caches, somewhere like that, 1,500, 1,900 in three days. And so when I came back to Connecticut, I, that put me to number two behind Yale Hockey Mom, or I think at the time, yeah. And, but then, then John decided to retire, and I had a new baby at the time, so I slowed down while these guys just sped up. 
<laughs> and they've been to the desert many more than me. Yeah, I've been three times to the desert, Nevada, and, and then to Texas twice. There's quite a bit of geo out, out on that highway, isn't there? Uh, well, the ET highway? Yeah. On the ET highway, I know there's an alien, an alien head in a spaceship. spaceship. I don't know what's out there now. And that's around um, the location of the little alien. It's like right in the middle of the ET highway. ET highway grew a lot since I've, I went. I think when I went, there was 1,500 caches, and now there's yeah, over 2,500. 2, wow. So if and you're a lot of you, for you, numbers, you, that's, that's the place yeah. to go. Oh, yeah. And, and, and it's funny because you, on Facebook, I'm a member of all these groups, and they're like, it's impossible to find, a, I think I found 900, 982 in one, one day. And they always say, oh, that's impossible. And they, they always get their math wrong in how many minutes there are in a day. Because <laughs> they go, that's in, impossible. Because, and their math is all wrong. It is possible. I think, I want to say the record is like 1,100 in one 24-hour period on the ET highway. Wow. That's a early morning and a late night. Yeah. And, and what you do on the ET highway, which is acceptable, the owners of the geocache write it in the description that they want you to do this and it's acceptable. You don't sign the logbook. You, you stamp the logbook in your car. They're all film canisters. You stamp it with your name on it. You pick up ET. ET1 is a litter box hybrid, which is an ammo can. But let's start with ET2. You pick up ET2, you drop your cache with your name on it. In the car, you stamp that log or in different ones. So you're always replacing logs. So you're never wow. signing and taking up time. So you throw the cash in the back seat, someone stamps it. The runner jumps out of the car, places that one down, picks the other one up, throws it in the car. That one stamps it with the name on it. So, you're, so one, two becomes three, three becomes four. And it saves a lot of time it's taking out the, instead of taking out the log book, signing it, putting it back. If you're good, you can do, you, at the time, you can't do it anymore because they've moved them back off the road a little bit more. Original ET Highway, we were doing four minutes. Wow. With, with three yeah, you're, in a rent -a, you're in a rent-a-car, so you don't care how fast you can punch it from one cache to the other. <laughs> and there's no one around. That, that road you can see for miles. You can see for miles on that road. You can see the next car coming, and it won't pass you for another seven minutes. That's how far you can see ahead, and you can just, you know, the road is clear and a lot of dust. A lot of dust. The rent a car becomes very dusty. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. That that is wild. <laughs> it's a it's a lot of fun. Some people, some people say all oh, power caching like that is no fun. It is a blast. You you get so silly with your friends in the car, you you know, you're out there in the middle of nowhere. It's just a total blast. When I went, I went with um, a cashier named J2 Brew. He was sure? an older gentleman who wanted nothing to do with power trails. And then on the plane ride home, he looks at me and he goes, Joe, I had the best time of my life. <laughs> and that's for someone who didn't like power caching at all. He just went because he knew that I wanted to go. That's great. I love it. <laughs> well, thank you all so much for getting together with me tonight and, and sharing all this about the Handicast GOR and, and sharing stories about the ET Highway and everything. I really do appreciate it. Thank you so much. You are welcome. You're welcome. Thank you for having us. You're welcome. Thank you for listening to Geocache Adventures with me, Shadow Dragon one Have you heard of FTF Magazine? It's the magazine for geocachers. It is full of articles and photos, all sent in by geocachers like you. In fact, some of the guests that you've heard on this show have submitted articles to Geocacher Magazine. They have 
all kinds of neat stuff and publish achievements that are sent in by geocachers. So if you have an achievement you want to celebrate, send it in and they will add it to the magazine. It is really cool. I recommend it. I subscribe to it myself and I love it. Go check it out at ftfgeo.com. That's ftfgeo.com. And let them know Shadow Dragon 1 sent you. Would you like to be a guest on the show? Do you have a topic you'd like to hear more about? Let me know at geocacheadventures.org. Go over to the contact page and you can send me a message there. It has the podcast email that you can email me to. Or you can reach out to Shadow Dragon 1 on geocaching.com. Geocacheadventures.org also has a store page now. You can go over there, geocacheadventures.org, and click on the store page in the menu bar and check it out. Got some great stuff over there for you.